my name is Josh Lipton. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Crowd Supply. Um, there are a bunch of people who were in the previous talk in this room uh, about cashless society. Is that right? Did did the presenter make a joke about BTC? Get it? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I hope I hope they did. Um, but actually, it's pretty related uh, to what I'm about to talk about. Uh, in a, in a, in a We'll get to in a second. Um, before I really get started, uh, brief introduction on crowd supply. We have a table downstairs. You should go check it out. My colleague Darl is there. Uh, he's selling stuff, and you should absolutely buy stuff from him. Um, but th no, really, there's a bunch of uh, things that have got funded and like, launched and funded and, and shipped on crowd supply. Crowd supply is a hardware, uh, open hardware crowdfunding platform. Um, we make everything from laptops to software-defined radios. We've done food, clothing, uh, bicycles, books, uh, really everything you can make. Um, and everything that's gotten funded with us has, has delivered so far. Uh, so if you pay for something, you get something. That's how commerce works. Uh, okay, so well, let's see, that didn't work. Oh, oh, okay, this is the Apple II. Yeah, uh, this was a lot of people's first computer. Um, and this is how a lot of people got into hardware, actually, right? Because the Apple II came with schematics, uh, actual hardware schematics. And you could debug it, you could change it, you could do all these things. Um, and it, and yeah, this was quite a while ago. And so by saying it came with schmat schematics, I don't mean it was like on the internet somewhere in a PDF. It actually came in the box, right? unfold it, you could look at it, admire it, even if you didn't understand what it was. Uh, one person who had an Apple II, uh, Andrew Bunny Huang, um, is, is a fairly uh, well-known hardware hacker these days. Uh, and he remembered how the Apple II had schematics and how he learned something from it. And he contrasted that with today's situation, right, where you're probably not going to get schematics, and frankly, you probably can't even open the thing, right? Um, a lot of MacBooks these days you can't even physically open, or if you could, it's all hermetically sealed, and there's really no parts replacement, right? So that inspired, was part of the inspiration for Bunny to uh, create the Novena. Um, this was one of our early projects at Crowd Supply. Uh, it's launched in uh, was it April of 2014, I believe. Um, <coughs> this is the laptop version. We have one of these downstairs uh, uh, on the table if you want to see the, the inside. This is the, the back side of it, actually. So it, it opens <coughs> like a European car, I guess, like a Saab. Uh, so that the screen is actually, if you look at it, you look on the front side, and then you, you plug in an external keyboard. There's no internal keyboard. But what you're seeing inside are all of the guts, right? You're seeing um, these are the speakers. This is an RC car battery. Uh, hard drive, there's a battery charging board um, right here, the daughter card to the main board, which is right here. That main board uh, has its port farm with USB and Ethernet. Notice that has two Ethernet jacks, so you could actually use the board itself as just a router. Um, has this kind of geeky power uh, or heat sink there. Um, and all of it is completely open source. Right, as open source as it could be. And that was one of the main criteria uh, for Bunny and Zob. Zob uh, was his partner in making this. Um, they wanted to make a laptop that they could use not only on their workbench and, and mix and match and, and remix however they wanted, uh, but also to make it completely open so other people could do it, right? Um, and that meant no one had to sign an NDA to get any of the parts. You, you could go out and make this thing on your own. It would cost you a lot of money to assemble the parts and redo the layout, and you know, the, all, the, all the layout and schematics were, were there. Uh, all the chips that, that they used on this um, didn't require an NDA or anything like that, uh, which really limited them. Because really, these days, for a laptop-grade computer, you have to sign some papers and sign some, some legal documents to even find out how those chips work. Um, if you want full access to the register maps or the full functionality of a chip, uh, this one chip by Freescale, it's an ARM-based uh, IMX6, I believe, 
um, was was the only choice. Uh, so that says something, considering how many chips were out there, right? All of the other ones required an NDA. Uh, so that was the state of the art about two years ago. Um, all the firmware, all the software, the open source runs Debian. It's great. <coughs> so computers today, you know, we're in this situation uh, where it's just like car mechanics, right? You can There's good, fast, and cheap car mechanics, but you only get to choose two of them. And you want to choose carefully, right? Um, computers today are the same way. Uh, you can get something inexpensive and fast in terms of, you know, gigahertz of the, of the uh, CPU or whatever methods you want, but it's probably not going to be good in, in the sense that, that we here understand as good, right? Open, right? Where you can, you can there's, it allows, it, it permits you to do things, uh, to learn, to explore, it, it protects your rights as a consumer, right? Similarly, you can, you can get the other two combinations, um, but there's nothing that has all three yet. And that's really what, what the, the crux of, of open silicon is. I'll, we'll get to that in a second. So an example of fast and cheap is actually this laptop here, the one I'm using. This was funded on Crowd Supply. This is called the Librem 13 by Purism. Um, it's a 13 inch laptop. It's based on an Intel chip. Uh, it costs pretty much the same as uh, another laptop uh, that looks like it and it has pretty high specs. Um, uh, and it's it's based on a modern chipset, right? Um, now, Purism's stated goal is to to m protect your freedom as a consumer, and they're they're doing that as well as they can, given that their their bar for entry is is a uh, modern computer, right? And this really speaks to the limitations of modern computing. Uh, in other words. They said, okay, we, we're going to use Intel because that's they have the best processors it's, it, and it's still affordable. And right there, that kind of discounts this computer for a lot of people, right? Now, from the BIOS level up, or from the bootloader up, it's all uh, it's all open source, right? The, the entire stack, you know, all the software they ship with it um, is open source. The, the kernel, uh, the, the BIOS, every, all of that. And yet, it, it's discounted for, for a lot of people for, um, from being in the free category, that's the Libre category, because of an Intel chip. And there's this the Intel management engine. Have, who, who here has heard of the Intel management engine? All right. And who here has actually done something about it? OK, cool. Uh, that's pretty much what I expect. It's really hard to do something about the Intel management engine. There are things you can do. Even in the last couple of months, stuff has come out where you can supposedly disable a lot of it. But the Intel management engine, for those of you who don't know, is essentially a coprocessor inside of the Intel CPU. So it's not a separate chip. It's actually baked in to the silicon of every modern processor uh, that Intel makes. And in fact, every modern processor that anybody makes these days. It's not called the Intel management engine. When AMD does it, they call it something else. But it's the same thing. Um, ostensibly, it's there to allow uh, remote management, as the name would imply. Right. So you can. As a system administrator administrating administering your your network uh, or your, your corporate network, you can kind of give a firmware update to all of your computers, right? Um, now, of course, that's a huge backdoor, and there's a lot of privacy concerns, especially because the Intel management engine is active if your computer is plugged in. Even if the computer looks like it's off, uh, it's it's that coprocessor is still running, and it has full access to everything your computer has access to normally. That includes the network stack the drives, everything. Um, the super concerning part is that it's completely closed source. Uh, you can't get the, the significant uh, binary blob in, in any other form than just that. Um, it's cryptographically signed, which we'll get to in a second. And so really, this is a, a privacy and security disaster waiting to happen if it already, had, already hasn't happened. Uh, and there are a lot of people who think it already has. Um, meaning that it's already been exploited, uh, not just by the good guys, whoever you think they are, but also by the bad guys, whoever you think you, whoever you think they are. Um, <coughs> so, this is not good in the sense that we're we're interested in, but it is fast and cheap, and it's it's in the same realm, right? People, it's they're trying to be libre, uh, but they're they're hamstrung by 
by availability of, of uh, the silicon. This is the EMA 68. Um, oh man, I put it in 68 so many times I forget what it actually stands for. It's uh, the M is modular. Embedded open modular architecture, I think. I'm not really sure. Uh, but this is the brainchild of Luke Layton. Um, he's off in Taiwan right now manufacturing these. This is good and cheap, but it's not fast at all. Uh, specifically, this card here in the lower left there, that is, if, if you were using laptops or peripherals in the 90s, you might recognize that as a PCMCIA card. And in fact, that is what the case is, right? But the actual electrical connections are totally different. The 68 stands for the, the uh, in the EMA 68 stands for the 68 pins on the other side. So you're seeing the, the port farm side of this card. The other side of the card is a standard 68 pin uh, receptacle that you'd see on a PCMCA card. So Luke's, I think, really clever idea um, was to use this form factor and use that casing, which is still available and relatively cheap, uh, to sandwich, to just shove an entire computer into, right? And that's your compute and your storage and everything that you think of when you think of a computer, except for the display, um, the hard drive. And so when I, when I mean storage, uh, you, you could have an external hard drive, but it has internal um, micro SD and whatnot. Um, so these two other things, the, the wooden thing on the left is a mini desktop version. You just slot that in, and there's a port farm in the back where you can plug in VGA, or uh, and there's USB, and so you can have a, a full-blown computer. Or there's this chassis here, the laptop chassis, um, which is 3D printed and has a, a commodity um, uh, keyboard and, and capacitive trackpad, um, you just slot it into the side and suddenly it's a full-blown computer, right? Otherwise it's just kind of an empty shell or a shell with a battery. Um, so these cards are 65 bucks. Uh, this funded on crowd supply, it's, in, it's being manufactured now. Um, and the idea is when you want to upgrade your computer, you don't just throw the whole computer away, you just throw away one piece of it, or you hopefully reuse one piece of it, or resell one piece of it. So you can get the card, you can upgrade to a new card, there's already another card in the works, which is slightly higher power. The card itself, uh, you know, Luke is, is a big stickler for that Libre part of it, so it's completely blob free, right? Meaning when I say blob, I mean compiled binary uh, from, from source that we don't have access to, right? Um, so there's no firmware, <coughs> firmware or uh, software on that, that that you can't examine and change for yourself. Um, now the silicon on it, what, what that means for the silicon and the chips on it is simply that it, those pieces of silicon don't require binary blobs to run, right? Which is great. We still don't have the source for the silicon itself, but it's a step better than than not even knowing how it's working or, or requiring firmware to even even have it do that. Um, so like I said, this is good and cheap, not fast. This is a rendering of the Talos uh, workstation. Um, again, launched on crowd supply. Uh, it did not hit its goal of, I think, three and a half million dollars, but it did raise over half a million dollars. Um, this is based on the Power, IBM Power 8 uh, ISA, uh, uh, instruction set architecture. Um, IBM still makes chips, actually. They're just really, really high-end chips. Uh, this board, even without the CPU, and for any peripherals or case or anything, is about 3700 bucks. For a full-blown workstation, we're talking $17,000. But, uh, which sounds really expensive, but it's actually pretty cheap when you compare it to comparable uh, workstations. Um, and it is completely Libre um, and super, super fast. Right? You can have 12 cores in here, translates to like 96 logical cores, uh, 256 gigabytes of RAM. Um, I believe it was DDR4, might have been DDR3, I don't remember, uh, but super fast, super uh, high powered. You could use this thing for 10 years probably and still be really productive on it. This would be used for things like uh, AAA title game development, um, high-end uh, uh, computer <coughs> design, um, big number crunching, you could slot this into a, uh, this, even though it's a workstation form factor, you could still use it in a, uh, um, a rack mount scenario, kind of as the master for a bunch of like deep learning nodes, um, 
this is the sort of stuff that you would see in Facebook's data centers or Google's data centers where the, the talking about deep learning has been a, a buzzword in the last nine months or so. Um, this is a, the, the level of hardware they're using. Not using this hardware exactly. Again, it didn't fund um, because it really wasn't cheap. And there were only so many people that needed or wanted something like this within a short period of time. So they didn't get to the minimum order quantity, unfortunately. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at uh, all three of these projects, right? The, the Librem, the EMA68, and the Talos all have project pages on Crowd Supply. They all have an update section in there that really goes into depth on the, the respective creators' <laughs> ideas on Libre uh, hardware, on open hardware, on, on the various ways that they weighed each of these uh, good, fast, cheap options. Um, <coughs> now, the Power 8 silicon the, the Power 8 chip that IBM makes um, is also not technically open silicon, uh, I, I think, uh, but you can license it and actually make your own chip, I believe. Uh, and so there's no mystery about how it works or anything like that. And it's actually a fairly simple architecture, which, which um, unlike the x86 architecture, uh, which requires a lot of workarounds and, and firmware. Um, so good, fast, cheap. Pick two. Here's an example. Um, this is Orwell. Uh, this funded on CrowdSupply I believe, last fall and uh, is shipping this month, I believe. Um, it has an Intel chip in it. Uh, so it has that Intel management engine problem. But they're working with a group of developers that work on Core Boot to uh, harden it as much as they can against against Intel management engine. Um, and the really special thing about this is that there's a processor. So first of all, this is a computer, not a Frisbee or something. Um, it's a secure computer. It's a desktop machine. Yeah, you can carry it around, but it doesn't have a battery. Actually, sorry, it does have a battery in it, but not that one that can run the, the whole machine. Uh, it is the digital equivalent of hermetically sealed, right? So there's physical protections inside of this case. The glass case is just a fancy thing, but underneath that there is a very brittle uh, mesh uh, on, on, a, on a plastic substrate of this gold mesh that is actively pulsed and, and you know, there's basically sending secret messages to itself right, constantly. And if it doesn't receive one of the secret messages it just sent to itself, it freaks out and assumes that somebody is trying to tamper with it, shuts everything down, and burns the, the, the private key, right? So uh, it's undergoing security um, uh, validation at the, I believe, the highest level um, that the federal government has. Uh, they're, they're working with a third party, a number of third parties, to um, get it certified for use in, in banks and uh, for medical records and things like that. Now, the interesting thing here is there are devices that already use this technology, right? If you make a point of sale system, you're gonna see a technology like this, but they're super specific devices. And, and this is the first general purpose computing device that, that um, brings this, this secure technology to, to consumers. Um, now, and it treats the, the uh, Intel processor as just kind of a subsystem. The, the real brains in this thing is what's called a secure microcontroller. Um, I believe it's just a 32-bit microcontroller uh, <coughs> by a company called ST Microelectronics. And that's what has, and then on that even, there's a, a separate mesh built into the die. So even if you do get through the first one and try to get the, the private key, it'll likely detect that. The battery inside, of course, is so that it keeps everything powered. And even if you unplug it, um, you, you, it will still detect a tampering event. Uh, now, like I said, the Intel subsystem, is, the, the Intel chip is considered a subsystem of this. So it doesn't even turn on until the secure microcontroller determines that there's no tamper event happening. So when you, you hit the power button, it checks everything with periphery, uh, says, okay, we're good. Now I'm gonna um, ask for, make sure this thing, this key fob is nearby and ask for a password. And if that's all good, then we can boot up. Right? I'll, I'll actually supply power to the, to the Intel subsystem. So um, 
in some ways you can mitigate the, against the, the Intel management engine by trusting this uh, secure microcontroller. Now I said the word trust, right? And that's a really interesting word in this context. There's trusted and there's trustworthy. And I think um, a number of security researchers have made this distinction really well. I'm just gonna gloss over it. Um, uh, but basically trusted is a bad word, right? It means that you don't know how it works and you're just kind of blindly trusting that this black box does what it says it does and that it's keeping your data safe. Trustworthy, on the other hand, is you know exactly how it works and because you know that, you, you trust the thing, right? Uh, so the secure microcontroller, like I was mentioning, is a trusted secure microcontroller, meaning that you have no idea how it works. You have to sign an NDA even to get one of these things uh, to incorporate into your own product. And of course, there's a chance there's a backdoor. So again, at the silicon level, um, and a very, very focused silicon level, uh, open silicon would make a big difference here, right? Um, and, and note the, the shift that just happened there, right? Instead of talking about a supremely complicated 64-bit x86 level processor, now we're just talking about a 32-bit kind of ARM processor. And so the, the complexity of what we're looking for has been greatly reduced, right? Meaning, meaning the utility of having a, a open silicon 32-bit uh, microprocessor is meaningful, right? Even though we wouldn't use it as our core core uh, computing element. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, so who makes silicon? Uh, there are actually a lot of people making silicon. Um, this uh, the slide from my last talk actually. Uh, Lime SDR was a, a project around the software defined radio um, by Lime Microsystems. Lime Microsystems makes their own chips, and by that I mean they design them. They have somebody else make them. I'll get to that in a second. But the point is. Uh, even a relatively small company can can make chips, uh, and this particular chip is not open silicon. Um, it's 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 basically an FPGA for for radio. But the point is that you can even through a crowdfunding campaign get this stuff made. Um, that, that by the way, I should say that this chip was already in production. The campaign was funding a product that the chip was used in. Uh, this is the actual product, the the Lime SDR. Okay, so this is the Hi5 one uh, by a company called Sci5. Who has heard of Sci5? Okay, and uh, Sci5 is a company that was founded by the creators of the RISC-V construction set architecture. RISC-V came out of Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and it was started as an academic um, tool. Right, as a tool to teach computer science students how to create an instruction set architecture, what that means, how to understand everything a computer does. So it's a very simple instruction set as, as RISC is, Reduced Instruction Set uh, Computing, um, which is what RISC stands for. It's the fifth generation of this. Uh, a lot of processors already use different versions of RISC. And notably, it's completely open source, and it's not owned by a company, right? So I mentioned the Palace project is using the IBM Power 8 uh, architecture. That architecture is owned by IBM. So if you want to use it, you have to pay them some money, which isn't the worst thing in the world. But that's very different than using an instruction set architecture that is completely open. I could go out as an individual with billions of dollars and make my own uh, silicon fab and just start making my own chips based on this, this design, right? Um, what you're seeing here is a development board. It's an Arduino compatible development board. Uh, and this chip right here is a custom chip that they made. It's the first in the world that I know of, of a RISC-V um, piece of silicon being sold to the general public. Uh, it's only available in this form factor, right? So you can't buy the chips themselves quite yet, but you can buy the development board. You can, you can hook it up. It's Arduino compatible. Use just like an, a regular Arduino. It's it blazingly fast. Um, and it goes up to uh, 160 megahertz or something. I don't remember. Um, uh, and it's really a proof of concept. It's saying that, that Risk Five is here, and there's another talk about Risk Five tomorrow. Completely coincidentally, I don't know even know who that is. Uh, you should go to it. I'm going to go, um, and I'm sure uh, they'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, so Risk Five, uh, this was announced in no late November last year. It's already shipped. Um, we have some downstairs at the table actually. Check them out. 
and we're, we're making more. Um, so how did this company do this, right? They, the, so okay, the founders, uh, or the creators of Risk Five, first of all, founded the company, so they have a lot of knowledge, um, but they don't have a foundry, they don't have a, a silicon fab. Uh, the reality is there's only about 12 places in the world where you can make silicon at this level, right? And this is not even that high of a level, right? We're, we're talking uh, a 32-bit microcontroller. Um, one of those places is in Taiwan, uh, or maybe even more than that, um, but it's just it's just about a dozen places. Now, the process of going from uh, a design for a chip to actually getting a chip in your hand is very complicated, right? And requires very specialized tools, almost none of which are open source themselves, um, and it's not like you can just take that design and go to any one of these 12 fabs either. You need to pick exactly which fab you're working with and use their tools or, or their libraries. Um, and most likely, you're not gonna be giving them the full design either, right? So in this case, for example, the core, the CPU core is what they designed. That's, that's the RISC-V thing. But then all the peripherals around it that actually make it useful are proprietary. Right, and, and came from these libraries that the Foundry provided them either for a licensing fee or, or whatever. Um, so those, are, those libraries are things like, those peripherals are things like uh, the GPIO, the general purpose input output, um, uh, any sort of memory or storage on there, um, pulse width modulation, analog to digital converter, which I don't think this has even, a digital analog converter, every peripheral that, that makes a microcontroller a microcontroller and not just a CPU. Uh, so none of that stuff is open on this, just the core. Um, so even though you have open silicon now, there's, it's usually surrounded, as in this case, by uh, a bunch of stuff that's not open. You have no idea what it's doing. Now, of course, you could do like some scanning electron microscopy and find out, um, but that's complicated and expensive and error prone. Uh, so this is a sample die of the Open 5 microcontroller. The Open 5 is also a RISC 5 based microcontroller, meaning it's the same sort of core, right? The, the same instruction set architecture. You could run the same code in theory on the, the High 5 1 that I just showed you and, and this guy. Um, it's being done by a group out of uh, Bucaramanga, Colombia. There's a university um, there that one of the, the researchers there has collected, he came from the, the silicon industry, uh, the IC industry, and he's kind of collected a very talented group of students and, and uh, researchers, and they have done everything I just described from scratch. So they've designed all of the components of a microcontroller that you'd want, the ADC, the DAC, the PWM, the DPIO, uh, uh, everything the core uh, from scratch to be completely open source. Um, and they launched a campaign with us as well, right? They actually launched about a week before the High Five won. Uh, now, the, the difference, of course, is uh, this is not, does not exist yet. The campaign is ongoing um, and has a much higher uh, <coughs> uh, funding threshold. I think it's about $400,000 right now. Um, if it is funded, then the chips will not only be produced and available on a, a development board, but they also be available for sale at competitive prices for use however you want. So you could use one of these things, say, in the Orwell instead of the secure microcontroller that they have currently. Not that this is comparable in the security features, but it could um, replace just the, the computational pieces. Uh, it has a true random number generator on it. Um, it'll have a bunch of neat peripherals. Uh, these two groups, even though they're in theory they're competitive because this is a fairly new space and everyone is uh, beliefs are aligned, they're actually working together. Um, so uh, this group, the Open Five, will adopt the High Five, the the, um, the the core CPU that High Five is using, and similarly <coughs> the peripherals that this chip uses will be used uh, in some sci-fi products later. Uh, so. Um, anybody know what a process node is? Process, okay, so we get a little bit into the the the, uh, 
details of, of how this is made. Um, there's something called a process snood in, in the semiconductor industry, and that is basically uh, how small your, your gates are going to be, how small your transistors are, right? When you actually etch it into pure silicon, uh, what's, is it uh, 190 nanometers, or is it like 28 nanometers, right? And so this is, this is right, right at the edge of, of um, Moore's Law. When people talk about Moore's Law, they're talking about what process node you, you're using, right? So in the time the state of the art right now is about 28 nanometers, I believe, and that, that's going to go down a little bit more, but probably not a whole lot more. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that the, the source code you're using, the, the equivalent of the source code for this design, right, is specific to the process node you're using. So it's, it's not only specific to which foundry you're using, but which process node at that foundry you're using. So are you using the 130, the 180, and there's a bunch of different process nodes. Um, the smaller you get, the more expensive the, the design. Yeah. Are you being flexible? Yeah, sure. Uh, if I were to render this like on an FPGA and compare that to actual silicon speed, what differences are you looking at? I assume it would be slower. Oh, um, it would be slower. Yeah, right, but, but not a ton. Of I, I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, and you can't, you can't take that source code. You can render it on an FPGA, and that's totally cool. Uh, but the complexity between that and, and actually getting silicon and, or just giving it to a, a foundry to make is, is really high because there's all these directives, kind of like compiler directives almost, like macros that are specific to the, the foundry and the process node. So even if you're at the same process node but you change foundries, you have to like kind of recompile or rewrite a lot of, a lot of work there. Um, the point there is that it's it's this is really at the cutting edge of open source, I believe. Uh, yeah. Are any of these foundries in the United States? Very few of them. So <laughs> IBM has one foundry. I believe it's one or two foundries left in the U.S. And that that IBM Power Eight processor is made in the U.S. as well. Um, and that's a whole different problem, right? Like, <laughs> do you trust who's making your chips? Uh, and do you trust who's transporting your chips and who's designing your chip? Uh, it, it, this is this gets into a lot of issues. Um, okay, so from process nodes, that's as, that's as low level as I'm going to go. At a higher level, I'm going to say that this is exactly what open the crowdfunded open hardware is good for. This is the killer app for crowdfunded open hardware. And I say that because, well, first of all, it, sh it has to be open for reasons that that I, I don't think we should. I think we, we mostly understand, but I'll, I'll be really specific about it in a second. Um, it has to be open to trust it, basically, right? And it has to be crowdfunded, I think, in part to gain that trust, but also because currently there are, are no companies or organizations or governments with the resources to make a chip that are incentivized to do so, right? I think that's quickly changing, and hopefully in the next year we'll see something interesting happen there. But what incentive would a company have to, let's say Facebook, what incentive would they have to make open silicon, right? Uh, yeah? I'll, I'll be that guy. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was correcting. There sure. Are, most certainly are organizations with resources, but they don't have the, an incentive to give you access to it. They exactly. Most oh, no, no, yeah, no, the, the resources exist. Yeah. Any one of these companies that we use every day could plop down however much money and get some chips made. Well, Apple does it. Well, I mean, but I mean, it's not like open. The, the PLA, they, 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 they make their own chips. They have that kind of stuff, but they're not giving it to No, they're not giving it Yeah, yeah. So, so plenty of people can make, have the resources to make silicon. No one is incentivized yet to make it open source, right? Um, well, I'm yeah. trying to, we keep talking about this topic, but if you look at what Facebook, for example, is doing there in the world of networking, right? Yep. Web design and mobile development, the same incentives that exist in there to do that, you can take other people and Yes. That's why you, you, I think you mentioned Facebook. We're kind of probably the same person that you work with. The, the incentive exists. Well, yeah, they just don't realize it yet. So, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right. And that, that's what I meant. I think in the next year, we might see some really interesting moves by people who could actually put down the money. And, and it's our job, really, to, to convince them that, yes, you, you have a good incentive to do this. Because tr consumer trust is, is something that matters, right? Um, so, okay, so why, why would, 
that's great from a from a philosophical level. Yeah, I want everything to be open. I want to be able to examine all that. But really, what's what's the thing that I'm going to use it for? Right? Is it a social media or you know, what, what, is it, what is it? Like, what's the what's the actual killer application? And I'm convinced that the killer application is identity. And this is what I meant by the, the previous talk ties back to this, right? My identity is that you know, I have thousands of passwords. They're all auto-generated. They're all stored somewhere safe. It's all encrypted, but it sucks, right? And passwords suck. Uh, so soon, we're going to just have cryptographically, cryptographically strong hardware that holds my one private key and probably a bunch of you know, equivalent to passwords. And that will be me, right? That for all intents and purposes, that is my identity. It will have my money. It will have all my credentials for logging in to whatever. Uh, it will be as simple as possible. It won't be my laptop. Um, it will just be a dongle whose sole job is to store and keep safe a verifiable, persistent identity that I control. Not that some company controls, because no one's going to buy into that, right? We've seen what happens there. But that I control, right? So it has to be distributed and, and decentralized. Um, the cost of doing this is in quantity that we would need for everyone to have something like this is a couple bucks, right? I mean, it's not a lot, but everyone has to have one. Uh, so that's where I think this is going. I think that open, crowdfunded open silicon is the way that it's going to get there. It might take 10 years or longer, right? I don't know. But, uh, but things have been happening very quickly. I mean, this, this picture didn't exist less than a year ago. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Happy to take other questions. I uh, appreciate your time and uh, attention. missed some of my slides but uh this guy here is the funding goal is four hundred thousand um, dollars and that's what it would take to uh you can buy chips but really th what they're really making the money on is the development boards and so that would would it take to make a couple thousand development boards that they saw the high margin and then fund the actual production um of i believe it's like fifteen thousand chips or something like that uh, so it's not like an astronomical amount, really, right? It, it's a known thing. It's really like getting the expertise on one spot and the money and the, the, the need for it is, is what's taking so long. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're out there, do you, do you, like if I had an idea for something like this, you would put me in touch with the team? Like what, what, what is your role? Yeah, yeah good idea. Board? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, so crowd supplies role in this, uh, we're firmly – entrenched in open hardware. That's what we believe in. This is exactly what we were designed to do. We're a crowdfunding platform um, that helps a project. The project comes in and says, hey, I have an idea for a, a totally blob-free network stack storage, which just funded last week. Uh, it's called the Newbie. And he's an engineer. He knows what he's doing. We kind of spot check the designs. Like, OK, you know what you're doing. That's great. The prototype works. Who do you have lined up to, to uh, manufacture it? Uh, I don't know. It's like, okay, well, you can talk to this guy or that guy. Or if you do know, great. Right? We're not going to do the manufacturing. What we'll do is the strategy, the campaign management, the actual fulfillment, customer support, um, and then we are usually the first reseller. Right? So we make most of our money actually selling things that have already funded, right? that we funded a long time ago, and that we're, we're now a reseller. We buy wholesale and sell at retail. Um, so that's where we come in. Uh, we have a provider directory that is a directory. The only way to get in is to actually – run a project that um, has used one of these vendors uh, or you have to be a vendor on what a project that's launched with us to get into it and so we have a, a pretty well vetted um, system of making sure you're you're going to deliver what you say you're going to deliver and to give you resources that you need to, to pull it off if you don't have them yourself um, that's what we do I'll say real quick this is our proclamation of user rights or this is like the, the cliff notes version um, you can read more about it on our about page. But this is the sort of stuff that we care about um, preserving and protecting uh, our, the products that we launch, endeavor to, to protect these these rights. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bruno, why do you have to buy a Wi-Fi desktop and how many kilobytes is there a difference? Uh, I can't tell you that yet. <laughs> but 
we're not very far away. I'll, I'll let you. I'll, it's it's in the works. Um, yeah. How, how powerful is Risk Five compared to the ARM? Well, Risk Five is is a new ISA, right? New instructions architecture. So it does not have a lot of the stuff that you would want, like a level three cache or I mean, there's all sorts of things that don't exist yet, right. um, and so it's not going to replace even this computer so yet. Not replace the Raspberry Pi yet? No, it could. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So you, you could have a, a laptop that could run a browser and do email. It could kind of ninety what ninety percent of people do, mm -hmm. but you might not have something that's open that's running a video or something like that yet, right? right. I, I don't I don't know the answer exactly, and it's constantly changing, but. Uh, it's it's pretty far behind, you know, the, the four decades or however long x86 has been around, um, but it's catching up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there compilers for Risky? Yep. Or specifically the LLVM backend. Um, I don't know which compiler. I think it, I think GCC. It, I think there's a GCC support. I haven't actually messed with it myself, um, but you know, there's there's. Plenty of school chains that, that are open. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So earlier you said was uh, it's possible getting into the Linux and IM with some exploiters. Yeah. Um, as of May first, which is where I was last checked for you. Yeah. You can <laughs> send an MC digest from Git admin on AMD. Yep. So I guess that would So I didn't know that. Lot, Thanks right? for telling me. Uh, I, I that so doesn't so surprise me at all. May first. Yeah. And then the details came out May fifth. That was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If, if it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, if it's plugged in to power, then the, the chip is running. And if it's plugged into the network, then it won't be running. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Anybody that, anybody that's sitting on that network has access to it. A lot of them say you have one and then one doesn't want to use it. Okay. Is the interface for the chip too sensitive to use on a breadboard? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, Th I should I should clarify. This is the die, right? And so, um, let me show you. Does it function in a zip package? It's going to be in a QFN. Let me find it real quick. Um, so. Okay, so here we go. So that's the, that's that chip I was showing you. That's a dime. Um, this won't take very long. It's super tiny. So that that will be taken and packaged and wire bonded to the the pins or the pads that you'd normally see, right? So um, it's a QFN32 package, like it says there. Uh, it will have all these peripherals. Um, and if you read the update section here. You'll you'll find out more about why it's actually, even though it's only eleven percent funded, why it might be funded soon. Uh, but check out this one, this part here. So this is the board. That's the wire bonded version. Now we're digging into actual RTL level transistor. That's a transistor. What you just saw. Oh. Yeah. So you seem to be focused on von Neumann style CPU architectures. Have you? Is the same level of difficulty required if you wanted to do like massive numbers of shaders and floating point <coughs> operations, like like a GPU or something like that? Does it get much more complicated to create a CPU like that or a GPU like that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I assume it's not. I I assume the actual design of the CPU or the chip isn't super crazy. It's just that there's a limited market. And it's the tools for using it that that <coughs> are hard, right? So with NVIDIA and those guys, they have amazing tools for software development using their chips. That so you don't have to understand what's going on at a hardware level, right? And I think uh, that's my guess is that that's kind of the where why it's so valuable, right? So I don't know I don't know the actual answer, um, but uh, that's my guess. Okay, yeah, so ch yeah, check out crowdsupply.com. Also, there's a bunch of stuff I didn't talk about, um, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of this is downstairs, and you, you can see it. 
Um, there. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great conference.